Hello and welcome to a fresh new series of London Eye. As the world debates whether Brexit will happen or not and what it could unleash onto the global financial space, whether the US interest rates will go up and whether this great rally which has started in February will fade going into the summer or continue to gather momentum. But I'm here in London to speak to some of the best financial minds out here and I start off this series with Russell Napier, the celebrated market economist who's got a rather dim view of how the rest of the year might pan out. Russell, a pleasure meeting you finally and uh, thank you for the effort of coming down all the way from Edinburgh for this. Uh, I hear you are going to be in Bombay in, or Mumbai in October as well, is that right? That's right, it's been a while since I've been and the exciting news is this time I'm bringing my course, The Practical History of Financial Markets. It's for investment managers, it takes two days. We've only ever really run that in, in uh, the United Kingdom and Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, but we thought there there's certainly enough fund managers in Mumbai, and we thought we'd come and we'd try Mumbai and see whether there's a, a demand for the, for the course there. So the course has been a great success, because what we do, and what I do in my work, and what we do in the course, is try to teach uh, what financial history has to say about how things work and mechanisms. And I think there's a realization amongst the investment community that we need to study more financial history, particularly because the role of politicians is coming back, the role of society is coming back, mm -hmm. and it's becoming clear by the day that this isn't just an issue of equations, and that's what we're trying to teach in the course. So that's 24th of October, so if, in case you want to meet Russell in Mumbai. But I need to start by asking you what you made of uh, Janet Yellen's statements. Uh, do you think she's saying that she can't afford to raise rates immediately? I think what Janet Yellen knows that we know, but where she has a little bit of added information, is some of the degrees of distress in the global financial system, particularly in the emerging markets. So she's obviously, several times in the last couple of years, pulled back from doing anything. I think what pulls her back is actually discussions with Christine Lagarde. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's often commented upon, but you know, it's Christine Lagarde who ultimately sees the distress in the system. There are a lot of people at the IMF looking for assistance. Now, rising US rates, potentially, strong dollar is the last thing that kind of edifice needs at the minute. Mm. So I think that's the reason she pulls back more than anything that's happening domestically. In fact, if you mention, if you look at her speech yesterday and the reason she was pulling back, mm. uh, actually most of them related to things that were happening well outside the boundaries of the United States of America. She specifically raised India, or sorry, China, and she specifically raised Brexit. So it's, it is interesting just to what extent international affairs are having an impact on her uh, behavior. Equity markets be happy then? Because there seems almost every time she pulls back there's a rapture. But should, on, on the other hand, equity markets, should they be worried? I think it should be the other way around. I mean, the, the history of this is if the Fed starts raising rates from very low levels because growth is accelerating or above expectations, then equity markets would not react negatively to that. Uh, a sign of higher growth and higher inflation is good for equity markets. Now, there's a limit to that, but I would say the limit in terms of inflation would be a level above 4%. Certainly, historically, uh, the equity market would tend to go up as long as inflation is trending upwards, but not hitting 4 And if U.S. rates are going up at the same time, it's not a negative for the equity market. Now, we're still quite a long way before we get to 4% uh, U.S. inflation. So I, you know, I'm confused because I look at it the other way around. I look at the failure to raise rates as the most frightening thing out there. Because if this economy is an economy heading towards recession, there's very little monetary ammunition left. So I took last Friday's figure as something truly dreadful for global equities. And the global transmission mechanism is the impact it has on America's external accounts. You know, if America's not going to grow as fast and its current account deficit isn't going to get bigger, then the emerging markets have got some serious, serious problems. And yet they all went up. There was a, rel a relief rally because the dollar came down and US rates aren't going up. So I think the markets are wrong on this. Mm. The problem is markets react like this and contrary to what you're saying, they remain wrong for some period of time. But how do you time this thing? Because longer term it looks like the trouble is brewing and it's building up. But we are in the midst of a two, three month rally out there. The simple answer might be it's impossible to time this thing. I mean, I think there's a nice quote from Warren Buffett who says investment is simple but not easy. Uh, which is very accurately uh, sums it up. The way to make it easier is to have a longer term time horizon and the more we get into second guessing short term gyrations in the market, the more we're likely to be wrong. So I know it's not advice that you can necessarily give the professional investor who is paid for activity, but certainly if anybody's watching this who's a private investor, it, it pays handsome dividends to take a longer term view and not try to time this 
uh, what you do is you, you build up a series of indicators that tell you which way it's going and you watch those indicators uh, and you, know, you have a view but if those indicators go the wrong way and you're wrong then you'll have to change your mind my view at the minute is the world is still heading towards deflation uh, and not inflation I don't see the evidence to change my mind on that and in terms of short term timing I think we just have to to all intents and purposes ignore it you think markets are ahead of themselves then? I do absolutely think they're ahead of themselves I think monetary policy uh, why are we where we are today from 2009? Well, it's because of monetary policy. But is it succeeding? And what is the definition of success? To me, the definition of success on their own terms would be to have nominal GDP growing faster than debt, degear the global system, which the, the general uh, consensus is that the reason we got into this mess is we were overgeared in 2007. Well, the global system is more geared today as a percentage of GDP than it was in 2007, so they failed. Now, if central banking fails, we're going to have to have another remedy, and that remedy is you know, fairly excessive active government action. I don't see how that can be good for return on capital employed for the equity market in particular. So what the market is still in a, of a view that central bankers will get us there eventually, and therefore you hold on. Uh, but if they're wrong on that, then we get something which I think will be bad for equity markets. And the, the poster child would be Japan, where I think it's becoming clearer by the day that monetary policy in isolation does not have the solution. So we may be close to a final uh, realization of what happens when monetary policy in isolation fails. What would convince you or what would convince policymakers in the West that that experiment is not working out? Well, the, the easy thing is a recession. I mean, if, if the jobs number last week is a, is a precursor for a recession, that's the first obvious thing. You've got to imagine that you are the President of the United States and you look around the, the, the room, you're in a recession uh, you know, towards the end of this year, you look around the room for advice you're probably not going to take a lot of advice from the central banker. You're probably going to say, well, you've been doing this since 2009 and it's not working. You're probably going to look around the rest of the table. Uh, and if you're President Clinton, who knows who might be at the rest of the table? You've got Paul Krugman at the table. You never know. Larry Summers will be at the table. And we all know what uh, Larry Summers would like to do, and that's much more government action, much more fiscal spending. So uh, there's going to be a shift to that coming along. Uh, why I don't fear fiscal spending for the market, but what I do fear, and particularly for Japan, is this combination of fiscal and monetary policy, mm -hmm. which is on uh, Mr. Ben Bernanke's list of things you do to defeat deflation. And I think it'll, it'll come to Japan first. I think the actual problem with the next step is it doesn't come uh, in unison. Uh, Prime Minister Abe, two weeks ago, was trying to persuade everybody we need to do this in unison. Uh, and in unison, I think it would work and it would be inflationary. But uh, you done unilaterally by one government, uh, I think Japan, it's not reflationary. It has a major dislocative effect on exchange rates. So I think Abe was trying to persuade everybody to do it, and he failed. So one of the things I'm looking at is that failure. What does it mean? And I think the temptation for Abe to go unilaterally on this policy is going to become overwhelming. And the more the yen goes up, the more that uh, is the case. And the, the impact on the yen would be pretty drastic, I think, if Abe is the first person to go to this, what was called helicopter body, which is the fusion of fiscal and monetary policy. So I think imminent for... Japan, but the democratic process or the, the nature of the long jam in the democratic process in both the United States and Europe suggests it's not imminent there. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Japan because the year started with fears around China and, and the currency devaluing there. That fear seems to have ebbed a bit, but what you're suggesting about Japan, would it necessarily have to trickle down to China next and they would also have to devalue their currency sharper than people are fearing today? So that's a, a great question because I think it would put huge pressure on the Chinese exchange rate. Remember, a weak yen is effectively a strong dollar and the Chinese would have to be to some extent following the dollar. But also I think politically they're looking for an excuse to devalue. The exchange rate target does tie their hands somewhat in terms of their domestic monetary policy. Mm -hmm. It is restricting their ability to reflate. Uh, but politically it's difficult to devalue an exchange rate when you run a current account surplus. And if you look at the press today and yesterday, you'll see a bit of a war of words between the Americans and the Chinese in terms of whether China is dumping or whether China is anti-competitive already. Mm -hmm. So you're really going to need a good political cover story to devalue that exchange rate. And there probably is no better one than a yen going 120, 130, 140 in that direction. So I do think almost as soon as the yen starts to go, within a few weeks, people will be focusing really straight back on China and its exchange rate. And I think we all know the implications of China is to devalue its exchange rate, what that means for global growth and deflation. So those fears will be back on the agenda very quickly if the yen is the first currency to fall based on the first implementation of what is known as helicopter money. If you had to choose something this summer which pricks the global mood bubble, I mean, what, what would you rate the highest? Would it be resurfacing fears from China? Would it be Japan? Would it be Brexit? 
or just a general realization that maybe recession is around the corner? Well, we're only in, we're in London, we're only a few weeks away from Brexit. So if it happens, clearly that's something that, because the first thing that happens on a Brexit is people begin to look elsewhere in Europe and say, who else constitutionally is going to demand a referendum? And I think that, that debate then will rage for months, quarters. So if it happens to be a Brexit, and I have no more insight on whether it is or not than anybody else, then it would clearly be a Brexit. It would really focus it on Europe. I've got a, a couple of other ones, actually, which are maybe not on the radar screen for you, but the Italian banking system would be, would be high on my list. In fact, the European banking system in, in general. And we're looking at some of the biggest banks in Europe. Their share prices have halved over 12 months. Now, that's not just Italy. Deutsche Bank, uh, Credit Suisse. You know, to me, it's very hard to believe in the health, robustness, and recovery of an economy when its banking share prices are... I mean, I think you can use the word collapse. Uh, and even yesterday, in a, in a you know, pretty good market, a, a bank share price like Unicredit, a very big Italian bank, share price down nearly 2%. So I would focus on Italian banks. I think that's an issue. But generally still, I don't believe that we have solved the issues for emerging market bankruptcies. Uh, higher commodity prices are clearly helping some of them but we still have significant distress in emerging markets. So I, I would put those, uh, Brexit if it happens, but uh, the thing that concerns me every day when I wake up and look at my Bloomberg screen is the price of European bank stocks. It's not telling us that that economy is in robust health, and it's telling us that some of the banks, particularly Italian banks, may be heading into distress. Mm -hmm. You think this rally should be sold into then? I mean, the sum of what you've been telling me, it's not painting a very rosy picture. Do you think this rally will fail this yeah, summer? Yeah, I do think this rally will fail. They usually fail in the summer uh, anyway. Uh, but I think the focus will be much more clearly on Europe quite soon, whether there's a Brexit or not. And has Europe really solved its banking problems? Because I think the evidence is building by the day. But it hasn't. I mean, this is going to be the world's second biggest economy. How can you be bullish on a global reflation if this one's really having another severe banking issue? And I think the final thing I should add on this issue is I think it's beginning to get more press now. There's something up with global trade as well. And the global trade numbers are dreadful, not just in terms of price. They should be lower in terms of price because commodity prices have come down, uh, but even in terms of volumes. Uh, you've got a whole, you know, half the world in the emerging markets trying to sell stuff to the other half. Mm. Uh, and if that isn't working, and it isn't working, it is also difficult to be, to be positive on the, on the global system. So I don't think, so I think there's things actually happening that the market isn't focusing on. The, these, the data points are already there. And I expect the focus to come on that more and more as we, as we go forward. At this point, a quick break on London Eye. You've been hearing Russell Napier. We're back with him after this break. Mm.